So hi everyone, welcome, good morning or good night, depending on your time zone, and welcome to attributes of a high performance low latency database. Um, in this session, myself, Zach Levitan, VP product, and uh, Benny. Hello, I'm uh, Benny Levy, I'm the director of software engineering in SILA, and I manage the uh, core database uh, software development team. So thanks, Benny. Benny will do the more technical part of this session, and I will do like the more soft history uh, session. So what we're going to cover today, I'm going to briefly introduce it with the company and Scylla project. Then we're going to very quickly cover 20 years of hardware evolution, how hardware changed in the last two decades. And uh, later we're going to show how Scylla was designed from scratch to match latest and greatest hardware. And then we're gonna present a few of the results of this design, basically demonstrating high performance. And as time permits, we're gonna to touch a little bit about workload prioritization and then a summary and the Q&A. So a little bit about Scylla. So uh, Scylla DB is a NoSQL database designed from scratch for high performance, particular very high throughput and very low latency. Uh, it's compatible in the protocol level with both, both Apache Cassandra and uh, Amazon DynamoDB. And by the protocol level, I mean that the same driver that you use with Cassandra or with Dynamo will just work out of the box with Scylla. We do have our own fork of the driver for a little bit higher performance, uh, but uh, that's out of scope for this session. Uh, Scylla coming in three main variants. Uh, one of them is the open source. You can download this, the code from GitHub or uh, Binary, Docker, whatever uh, way you want to consume it, even compile it if, if you are in this, uh, if you have some time on your hand. Uh, the second uh, variant is Scylla Enterprise. It's a closed source project based on open source and so 95% of the code is uh, shared. Scylla Enterprise do have a few unique feature around security, some of them around workload prioritization that we're gonna cover in this session a compaction strategy and more. And last but not least is the Scylla Cloud. Scylla Cloud is a fully managed Scylla Enterprise version that we are managing for you. Uh, so it's running on our, either on our account or your AWS account available on AWS and GCP. It's the same database inside, but uh, simply fully managed by us, including 24 by seven monitoring. And with that, uh, let me very, very quickly explain the Scylla architecture. So Scylla is a distributed NoSQL database. And by distributed, I mean it's, it's a stretch across multiple nodes. A, a Scylla cluster can grow from three nodes to hundreds of nodes, although you usually won't need as many. The deployment can be on one data center, as we see here, or on multiple data center. And data center very often match to region, for example, on AWS, so you can have one data center in Europe, one data center in the East Coast, one data center in the West Coast, and Scylla synchronized between, between all of these uh, information elements by itself. Scylla use what is called eventual consistency, and you can set the consistency uh, and the replication uh, to your will, but that's everything uh, around the consistency and replication is out of scope for this session, because in this session today, we want to focus more on a specific node and how we optimize the performance of the specific node. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so, so let's explain very quickly how hardware changed in the last uh, 20 years or so. So if you look at the, at the price of the RAM in the last 20 years, you can see that it exponentially decrease uh, more than 1,000 fold. So uh, this is from 1970 to today, and I'm sure this trend will continue and continue. So RAM become uh, very cheap compared to how it used to be, and that means that a server this day can have a terabyte of RAM even, something which probably imaginable just a few years ago. In addition to that, and I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, that uh, according to Moore law, the number of transistors per CPU is growing exponentially or double every 18 months. This is true and this continues to happen as you can see in, in the top uh, uh, triangle diagram, but something changed 15 years ago. 
And what have changed, you can see that the performance of a single thread or a single core is actually pretty plateau in the last decade or so. And one of the reasons that you can no longer increase the frequency of a specific core, simply because of physical limitation, the higher the frequency go, the hotter and hotter the, the CPU become, and at some point you don't want to melt it down. So in this front, progress is stopped, but you can see that the number of the transistor continue to grow, and that's because of the growth in number of logical core per server. So if just a few years ago, a four core machine or eight core machine considered to be huge, these days we have 96, 128 cores machine, and the cloud actually brought this machine closer to us because it used to be something very expensive that not everyone can afford, but these days you can just hire one of these huge machine, either long term or short term, and it's very much available. And the people are using it more and more, but the problem is that not all, not all applications can take advantage of that. Another change in architecture that come uh, with the, the, the increased number of core is uh, what is called non-uniform memory access or NUMA. Uh, in the past, all the cores started with one core, but if you have a dual core or four core, all of them have the same access to all the memory. Uh, this day is not the case anymore. And the memory is actually physically split between parts of the, of the, of the motherboard of the core. So some of the core are closer to have local access to part of the RAM, but have remote access to other parts of the RAM. So if, you, if a core need to access a memory which is further away from it, it will increase latency. Again, a change that a newer application like Scylla can, can account for, but older application cannot. Uh, so to summarize what happened in the last uh, 20 years, number of core grow from one to many. Uh, the RAM uh, become cheaper and cheaper, each server have more and more RAM. One thing I didn't talk much about is the speed of disk, in particular, introduction of uh, off-the-shelf SSDs. So these days, it's, uh, SSDs, especially on the cloud, become very accessible. And, and most of the Scylla deployment actually use SSDs with higher bandwidth and much lower latency. And all of these channels, you can see at the bottom, I wouldn't say it's a typical machine these days, but there are machines out there with more than 200 score. And I'm sure that in the next few years, this, this uh, trend will continue and continue. And the question is, which application are built to handle this huge change in architecture? Uh, so before we jump into the actual design of Scylla, I want to do a quick uh, pull. Uh, where are you guys on your uh, NoSQL ad adaptation? If you're already using NoSQL, please wave your hands. I cannot really see it. Was a joke, but do do fill up the pool, please. And uh, Benny, you can take control in the meantime of the slides. Benny, maybe you are on mute. Yes. All right. So um, in my part of the session, I'll try to uh, drill a little bit uh, down into uh, the details and explain how Scylla achieves uh, high performance. Uh, it's high throughput and low latency. Um, and uh, the secret is in, in, in the sauce in our case. Uh, and uh, the basics of uh, translating the hardware architecture uh, into our software architecture uh, that makes uh, the best use of the hardware. Uh, so I love this picture. <laughs> it shows uh, on the left side uh, what happens with the uh, traditional threading model where the threads have no locality of access and they all compete on the same shared resources leading to contention where some threads get more, some threads may get uh, less. Uh, while on the right hand, hand side, we can see um, how when we assign uh, each consumer uh, its own resources and the consumers don't compete with each other on the resources, 
each one can get uh, their own dog food uh, without infer interfering with each other. Um, so how do we achieve this in the database? Um, the first concept that we rely on is uh, sharding or partitioning of uh, the data itself. Uh, this is a common concept that uh, was used uh, in distributed database uh, for a long time. And in particular with uh, Cassandra that uh, inspired Scylla. Uh, the database, database itself is uh, broken um, into a number of non-interacting parts uh, based on the partition key. Um, we compute a um, hash function of the partition key to provide us with uh, a token. Uh, and then we just use a modulo function um, to map uh, each token uh, to a particular node in the system. So that's the first order of uh, uh, partitioning that allows us to um, uh, partition the database uh, 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 data onto different nodes. Uh, we still get some um, unbalanced, unbalanced distribution uh, this way, that's an <laughs> effect of life. Um, and in trying to reduce it, we also uh, do a second level uh, hashing of uh, the partition key and map each partition into a uh, core that's running on the, that server. What does that allow us? Uh, if in the uh, Cassandra model, uh, the Cassandra client, uh, given the partition key, can calculate uh, which node is uh, best to uh, communicate with, and uh, that's the node that uh, a node that owns this uh, partition, uh, with Scylla's uh, shardware driver, um, the client can uh, communicate directly uh, with uh, the shard that owns uh, that partition. Um, and that allows us to reduce uh, latency uh, when accessing uh, this particular shard as uh, each shard listens on its own uh, network port and the client can communicate it with it uh, directly. Uh, note that on the right-hand side, uh, when we have uh, multiple uh, shards running on the same physical hardware, uh, each shard is using uh, its own resources, but the shards can uh, share data uh, over the shared memory, uh, but they do need to uh, uh, manage the access to the shared data. And for that, uh, they have uh, uh, SMP message queues uh, between the shards. Uh, we implemented uh, Scylla over a library uh, called Cistar which um, implements the uh, core scheduling primitive that uh, Scylla relies on. Scylla itself is uh, open source as well. Uh, it's used by other projects uh, besides uh, Scylla, uh, like uh, Ceph, which is a distributed uh, object uh, storage system, Red Panda, Valisor, and other applications. Uh, it implements a mini operating system in user space in the sense that it controls access uh, to the physical resources um, on, on the server. Um, it was inspired by um, KVM uh, initially, and it's not a big surprise because it's done, uh, it was done by the same uh, people. Uh, same, the founders of Scylla were also the founders of uh, KVM in uh, Linux. Um, Opsystar itself has a task uh, scheduler uh, as well as an I.O. scheduler. Uh, it's fully asynchronous. Uh, it allows running uh, a, a parallel uh, tasks uh, by using uh, coroutines in user space. It also facilitates uh, direct I.O. to storage. And by that, it bypasses the kernel page cache. And we'll talk more about that uh, later. Uh, note that that means that if the application requires caching, it must implement uh, the cache on its own. So it can't really rely on the kernel page cache when uh, performing direct IO. Um, Cicero itself uh, runs one physical thread, one kernel thread per physical core. And uh, it also assigned a single shard uh, over that core. 
um, let's let's talk a bit of this, a bit of this, compare um, the tradition of software stack that's uh, used by Cassandra versus uh, the shard based uh, stack used by Scylla. So on the left hand side is a traditional diagram of uh, uh, the application stack where uh, the application runs uh, a number of uh, parallel threads that have no locality of access. They may run um, on any physical core at any given point in time. Um, and scheduling relies on the uh, kernel facilities uh, that uh, has a task scheduler. Um, it has a memory management uh, subsystem. It has its own uh, networking stack. Um, and all these are not, were not built uh, particularly to databases. Uh, they're built for general purpose applications and they're not doing the best job for databases. Uh, that model leads to um, lock contention uh, where threads have to acquire locks to protect access to uh, shared data structures and these locks are expensive. Um, it uh, creates contention also on the cache uh, where all the threads uh, use the shared cache. And it's also NUMA unfriendly because the threads assume uh, a flat memory model where access to every bit of memory uh, costs the same. While in practice, modern architecture has uh, non-uniform mem memory access. Uh, and accessing uh, memory on a uh, that's managed by a remote core is much more expensive than uh, accessing uh, memory locally, um, especially when the access is uh, both read and write. Um, so at any given point in time, um, typically only one core can um, hold a dirty uh, memory cache row. And uh, if another core tries to write to the same uh, cache row, they need to coordinate the access and uh, to achieve uh, a, a, a virtually um, uh, symmetric uh, memory model. On the right hand side, we can uh, uh, see a diagram of uh, CSTAR's uh, sharded stick uh, where the core database application um, uh, is collocated with the stuff scheduler and the um, uh, IO and uh, uh, networking queues all running in a user space. Um, and uh, the application can access the physical resources, uh, the CPU memory um, uh, networking queues and, and uh, disk queues uh, without having to issue uh, system calls. Uh, which are also expensive and we try to eliminate them as much as possible. Um, in this model, it's important to, to note uh, that, that we can uh, minimize and almost eliminate uh, lock contention um, since uh, when each shard is accessing only the memory um, that's collocated uh, with the physical core it's running on, um, we can take advantage of CSTAR's um, uh, cooperative preemption model, uh, where unlike the traditional threading model in which uh, the kernel uh, can uh, preempt a uh, running thread at any time and uh, give access uh, to the CPU to any other thread, uh, in CSTAR when a uh, CSTAR task is uh, running, it's uh, ensured that no other task uh, can run concurrently on that same uh, core. Other tasks can run in parallel and do run in parallel uh, on other cores, but uh, once uh, a task uh, is granted uh, um, access uh, to the CPU and it starts running, uh, it needs to either explicitly yield uh, so that other tasks uh, can run um, or there are there are implicit yield points uh, uh, with async uh, continuation. Uh, this allows us to uh, uh, reduce contention on uh, uh, we don't need locks uh, to protect access to shared memory on the same shard. Um, let's also compare the caching model of Cassandra versus uh, Scylla. Um, 
Uh, Cassandra keeps a, um, a key, partition key cache, as well as a row cache in user space along with the application. Uh, but it needs to resort to the Linux page cache uh, uh, to read data from the SSable uh, file. Um, that means that uh, for every miss in the cache, uh, Cassandra has to uh, issue a system call uh, to uh, fetch a page uh, uh, from the page cache. And uh, when it's using a, a, a shared memory mapping of the file, uh, this will uh, uh, result in a page fault uh, to serve the uh, um, unmapped page when, it's, uh, when Cassandra needs access to, to that page. Uh, in contrast, um, um, Scylla's unified cache is implemented in user space. Um, and uh, the code uses the same memory, both for uh, um, caching keys and rows, as well as the uh, other buffers, like IO buffers that we need to read and write uh, uh, data uh, to this. Um, when we um, um, switch, reassign memory uh, between uh, uh, caching uh, um, the database data versus uh, uh, serving general purpose buffers, we can do it without any context switches and in much, much better latency uh, comparing to Cassandra. Um, another mechanism uh, that we use to reduce latency is uh, controlling the um, uh, disk concurrency. Uh, that's an important pillar of our uh, IO subsystem architecture. Um, so on the left-hand side, we can uh, uh, see the results of an experiment uh, where on the x-axis, uh, we show uh, what happens when we uh, increase the parallelism and send uh, increasingly num uh, uh, more, uh, a number of uh, IO requests to the disk. Uh, the y-axis uh, shows on the left side the, the achieved throughput and the, on the right side in red, uh, the IO latency uh, for uh, the IO request. And uh, we can see that as expected uh, when uh, concurrency increases, we can get more throughput out of the disk up to a certain point. Uh, but when we keep increasing uh, uh, the concurrency, we, don't, we can't get any more throughput uh, but we lose in latency because uh, it, it takes more time to serve uh, these requests. Um, so in CSTAR, we have a um, um, calibration process where we uh, measure where this knee uh, in, in performance is, and we try uh, to limit the number of uh, parallel requests uh, sent to the disk. So to achieve the uh, maximum possible throughput, but with the, um, the least uh, uh, latency. Um, and uh, we do this with the CSTAR IO scheduler. Um, so how does scheduling work in uh, CSTAR? Uh, right in the middle, uh, we can see that we have uh, um, a number of uh, queues in the system. We have a, a queue for the uh, commit log operations, uh, the main table has a queue, compassion has a queue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, each uh, uh, such process in, in, uh, in the system is running uh, uh, using a uh, scheduling group. And uh, each scheduling group is uh, granted with a number of uh, shares that uh, determine its relative priority in the system. Um, so on top of these uh, um, scheduling groups, uh, we have um, monitors in the system uh, that monitor the uh, um, usage and the utilization of different uh, physical resources. So on the left-hand side, we can see, uh, for example, um, a memory monitor that monitors um, how much memory is used by the main table. Uh, and it uses this metric to adjust uh, the priority for the main table uh, scheduling group in runtime. And uh, we'll show how this works in practice on a later slide. Uh, similarly, we have a um, 
compaction backlog monitor that determines the number of shares granted to compaction based on the backlog of compaction. So if compaction doesn't keep up uh, with the uh, rate of new writes coming into the system, uh, what will happen is that uh, uh, we will have more mem table flushes that will create more and more SS tables. And when compaction doesn't keep up, this queue of new SS tables that need compaction keeps growing. Uh, so the compaction backlog monitor sees that. And in response, it can increase the number of shares assigned uh, to compaction so that compaction run uh, at, higher, at higher priority. Um, so how does this look in practice? Uh, we can see here another uh, um, uh, experiment that we ran where on the top left side, uh, we see a right workload that uh, fills the mem table. Uh, and this is experiment ran without the mem table controller, without controlling the mem table uh, uh, priority. And uh, we see that once uh, a mem table flush kicks in, we see a significant dip in uh, performance of the user workload. That means that uh, mem table flush was too aggressive and uh, it took too much resources out of the system that uh, needed to be used by uh, user requests. In contrast, on the bottom right side, we can see uh, how this uh, workload looks uh, when engaging the mem table controller. And in this case, we can barely notice when mem tables are getting flushed. And, uh, and the user workload can go um, undisrupted. Uh, so that's it for this part of my talk. And uh, Julia, I, I believe we have another poll. So thanks, Benny. And I will give you a few uh, seconds to answer the poll. And in the meantime, I want to quickly address a question that I saw in the Q&A. So there was a question about hot partition. So hot partition is, is a real problem on any distributed database. And it can happen if you model uh, your, your data incorrectly or you assume something which turned out to be false. So we have a few monitoring tools uh, to first identify hot partition. One of them is a node tool uh, to partition and the second one is a monitoring system. Um, usually there is no easy solution to hard partition that, uh, either than uh, changing your partition key, which is not always trivial in production. So that's definitely something to consider when you're doing data modeling. And I will recommend uh, uh, there is a Silo University session on data modeling, and we're actually going to cover that in detail in the upcoming Silo University live session. Uh, but that's out of scope. Uh, data modeling is out of scope for this uh, webinar. Uh, so before we continue, I want to quickly show some results of recent benchmark that we did that take advantage of the design that uh, Benny uh, uh, briefly described. And in this uh, latest uh, uh, test, we compare uh, three types of cluster, each of them with the same power of three nodes. And uh, what we did is inject more and more throughput to, to the cluster and test the latency. And in particular, we are looking at a 99% latency and 90% latency, which are the more critical or more important uh, to most application compared to the average of 50% latency. And if you just look at the blue lines at the bottom, you see that we're injecting more and more throughput to Scylla and the latency uh, continue to be very, very consistent and very stable. It does grow with time, and do cross in the 99% and do cross the five millisecond at some point. By the way, the average latency uh, will be low, below a one millisecond in these cases. Uh, you can see that Cassandra 4.0 and Cassandra 3.11 um, very quickly uh, get overloaded and simply stop working at some point. Cassandra 4 is the latest version, which is better significantly than Cassandra 3. But both of them cannot support such, such a high throughput. Uh, 
And the reason is that it was not developed with the latest hardware in mind. And so this is a write latency, a very similar, uh, sorry, okay. So we have a very similar chart to read latency. It's basically showing a similar results. So I won't spend time on it. One interesting use case that, that I do want to, to spend a few seconds on is we compare a, a cluster of four nodes of Scylla versus a 40 nodes of Cassandra. Of course, the nodes are the same, the same hardware. As, as you can see, the performance of a 40 node cluster is basically the same as a four node cluster of Scylla. And the reason is that Scylla take advantage of the, of the hardware uh, to the extreme uh, with all the features that Benny mentioned and many, many others. So we invested a lot and a lot of time and a lot of years of work uh, optimizing Scylla for the latest hardware. And you can see the result here. You can uh, take 40 nodes of Cassandra, replace them with four nodes of, of Scylla and, and the reason that I'm showing it, it's not because Cassandra is specifically a bad product. We actually took a lot of the algorithm that Cassandra used and adopted them. It's simply that the core database was not designed for latest hardware, uh, while Scylla was. And just a quick uh, real use case for one of our customer, Comcast in this case, that uh, was able to reduce the, the Cassandra node significantly uh, when moving to Scylla, this is, by the way, it's not a one cluster situation here. They have multiple cluster, each of them with different uh, size and, and they're across all of this cluster, they reduce the number uh, uh, from more than 900 to 78. And of course, when you are working with the cloud, as I'm sure most of the people on this, on this uh, webinar is, there is a very quick translation be between the number of nodes that you are running to the cost that you are paying to to AWS, which as you all know, can be <laughs> significant. Uh, okay, the last topic that we're gonna touch on is workload prioritization. So first I'm gonna quickly explain the motivation for this feature and why we develop it. And then I will let Benny explain the internal and how would, was it implemented. So uh, workload prioritization, the, the most common example for workload prioritization, but not the only one, is when you run two different types of workload on the same database and, and two very common use cases, the OLTP and OLAP. OLTP is a online transaction, a real-time transaction. An example for that, think about a mobile game that you are playing. So the mobile game in real time updates some centralized database and both write and read from this database. Maybe the state of, of another player, and update its own state. And it's very critical to have the latency of the update sub millisecond, or at least sub millisecond in the database because it have probably have more hoops in the middle like the application. So you want to keep this workload on a very, very low latency. A other kind of workload uh, is analytic workload. So if we're going back to the game example, uh, probably some BI or data science engineer sitting at the end of the day, uh, running some analytics, ad hoc analytics across all games and want to find out who is the best player, who is, who is the player that paid most money, who is the player that sold most advertising, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of ad hoc query have completely different requirements. Most of all, they are not as latency critical. So this kind of analytic can take a minute or it can take two minutes. Usually you don't care as much uh, you do care, but not as much as the online request. So, so these are, can be implemented with two different data, database, uh, but on many cases, you don't want two databases. You want one database because the information is already there, but you do want to take care to isolate these two use case and, and what can happen if you're not careful that when you're running an analytic workload, you're actually gonna hurt the online player that are using the real-time uh, queries and update. Uh, so what you would like to have, and as we will see Scylla have it, is, is a way to define how much resources you allocate in for the analytics, which probably gonna be like 10%, and how much resources you are gonna allocate for the real time, which is, can be something like 90%. And, and not just that, you want that if for some reason, maybe in the middle of the night or something like that, there is not as many real time player, you can allocate 
more resources is the analytic. But if there is more players, you want to limit the analytics to 10%. So this is in, in a nutshell, the, the motivation for workload prioritization. And I'm gonna switch back to Benny to explain how we implemented that. Benny, if you can show your slides. All right, got it. Um, so uh, basically to um, um, serve a number of uh, different uh, workloads at the same time, uh, we uh, took advantage of our um, scheduling building blocks that we already uh, uh, used internally for the different uh, processes. Uh, like I explained before, uh, we have different uh, scheduling groups for name table flushing, for compaction, uh, and so on. Uh, so we built on the same mechanism and applied it on the uh, user queries. Uh, so let's uh, go back a bit, talk about uh, the basics of uh, scheduling in, in uh, CSAR. Uh, so the scheduling decisions are based solely on a uh, number of shares. Uh, so to uh, uh, recap, um, we have uh, a concept called the scheduling uh, group. Uh, and each uh, scheduling group is assigned a number of uh, shares. And uh, we use uh, that number uh, to divide or to control access to uh, physical resources in the system. Uh, so for example, on the right hand uh, side, uh, we can see uh, two queues in front of uh, the scheduler. Uh, the red one on the left is, uh, is given uh, 200 shares. Uh, while the uh, right one uh, in, in blue is given 600 shares. Uh, and that means that we would like to uh, divide the access to the resource um, in that ratio of uh, 200 to 600. Uh, so given that ratio for each uh, request we serve from the uh, red queue, we will serve three requests uh, out of the blue queue. And uh, this way we uh, uh, um, divide uh, the resource capabilities in that ratio between uh, the different uh, consumers. Um, it's important to note that uh, the scheduler kicks in only when uh, there, is a, there is contention on the resource. Uh, that means that if, uh, for example, we only have the red consumer at uh, some point in time, it will not get one quarter of uh, uh, the resource, whether it be the CPU or disk or network. It, it can get 100% uh, of the resource because there is no competition at this time. Uh, but once we get more requests uh, from the blue queue, uh, we will provide them their uh, share of the resource based on the, uh, the ratio of shares assigned to their relative, uh, to their respective scheduling group. Um, also remind that the scheduling is dynamic and the number of shares can change uh, dynamically uh, in real time. Um, so how does that, does that apply to user workloads? You probably recognize this uh, slide as we uh, shown it uh, earlier. So in addition to the system monitors and the uh, system queues we already have, we just had to add Another, uh, uh, another controller, which is the service level controller on the uh, bottom left side uh, that controls uh, the number of shares assigned to a SQL query when it starts uh, running. Um, and how is, it, how is that done? Um, let's uh, remind ourselves that uh, each, uh, uh, each SQL query can run on behalf of uh, a predefined user. Um, so what we did in Scylla is uh, we extended the CQL with uh, roles and uh, service level. Uh, this way we can uh, grant a particular number of shares uh, to roles and then associate uh, the roles uh, by uh, granting a role 
to a particular user. So running a query on behalf of a, a, a particular user uh, defines the workload uh, priority given to that query. Um, and uh, lastly, on the, this part, uh, this graph uh, shows uh, an experiment that we ran uh, when we ran uh, three simulated uh, workloads concurrently uh, on, on the span system, uh, where the uh, different workloads uh, were granted a different number of shares, respectively. So the first workload was granted 200 shares, the second one 400 shares, and the third one twice as that uh, was granted 800 shares. And uh, we see that uh, on, on the latency graph, uh, how the workloads can operate uh, together without interfering with uh, each other. And uh, the measured latencies uh, shown on the upper right, uh, right hand of uh, uh, the graph uh, demonstrate that the achieved latency, achieved latencies follows, follow exactly the same ratio of the number of shares. So uh, uh, the slowest workload in green achieved around uh, 60 millisecond latency. Uh, then the second workload in yellow uh, that got half as many shares, uh, um, sorry, got uh, twice as many shares, uh, got half the latency, got around 30 millisecond. And then the, um, uh, the highest priority workload in blue uh, achieved around 15 millisecond, which is uh, twice as uh, as better as the 30 milliseconds for the yellow workload. Uh, and that's it. That Thanks, Benny. Uh, ju just want to mention one thing about workload prioritization. It's true that, that the use case we presented here is analytics versus real time, but um, there are other use cases. And one popular one is imagine that you have five applications within and writing from the same database or the same tables even. And you want to make sure no application take exhausts the database and hurt the performance of the other uh, application. So you can simply split the share, for example, 20% for each to each of the application and, and basically solve this problem. Keep in mind that what, when you allocate 20, 20 share or 20% 20 of the share to an application, it doesn't mean that it can only use that. It means it can only use that if all the other applications are active. If none of the application is active, these 20 shares, 20% 20 of share can take the full resources for the machine. So, so it's a very useful isolation mechanism, both for analytics in real time, but also between real time application. And, and with that, let me quickly recap what we cover in this session. Uh, so I briefly presented the change in hardware in the last uh, two decades, mainly uh, multiple cores. Then we explain how Scylla was designed uh, to match this new modern hardware. And we uh, uh, presented some of our result of this uh, completely new architecture in, in few benchmarks that we recently did. Uh, and uh, last, we show how we expose the internal controller and, and the internal scheduler through a mechanism called workload prioritization and allow the user to set uh, its own, uh, or not, not to, to control the schedule in some way, not full control, but some control of the schedule. Uh, so with that, uh, let me conclude and, and move to the Q&A part. I do want to mention, I actually mentioned it before, but uh, we do have a Silo University live event uh, at November. Uh, it's two dates, but each of the dates contain everything. It's, it's uh, one in the time zone for, uh, for the U European guys and one in the time zone for the American and the rest of the world have to, have to match that. Each of, each of the day will have two tracks, one advanced and one basic. And I will be, by the way, on the basic track, I will cover uh, uh, data modeling, uh, which is a topic that uh, people ask questions about today, like hard partition and how to avoid them. So everyone is more than welcome uh, to the next event. And by that, uh, let me switch to the Q and A. We have a question from uh, Attila. That uh, had a, a question regarding the uh, benchmark uh, comparison of uh, Scylla versus Cassandra. 
Okay, so uh, we have a full, instead of giving you the full answer now, I will uh, simply refer you to a, a blog post that was recently published. Um, I would quickly try to find it and share the link here, but the, there are actually two blog posts with the, the full spec of this uh, benchmark. So I suggest go, go and read there. And in, in the meantime, I'm trying to, to look for it. Um, okay, another question that, that I got is, uh, what is the easiest way to get started with Scylla? Um, so I would say there, there is more than one way. Um, the easiest way probably is Scylla Cloud because you don't have to install anything and you don't have to do anything, just go to, to Scylla Cloud and, uh, and, and use it from there. And a second pretty easy way to run Scylla is with Docker. Um, you, even on the new, the latest Mac, uh, you can run Scylla Docker and, and uh, just uh, test it there. Uh, if you if you run on the cloud and you want to uh, to launch your own instance, there is a Scylla AMI on AWS. There is an image on GCP, and very soon we'll have an image on Azure as well. Um, so Scylla Cloud, then Docker, then probably run uh, your own instance. Uh, thanks, Julia. Just shared the the, the link to the post uh, blog post with all the results and all the setup in in a lot of details. And by the way, for all the benchmark that we are doing, we try to give enough information to make it reproducible. And we really love if people do try to reproduce the benchmark, and if they get different results, uh, come back to us and give us feedback. Uh, because we, we don't want to, to create like a black magic box or something. We do want to make everything uh, repeatable. Um, okay. I don't see any additional question at this point. Uh, okay, one more question actually, that will be the last for today. Do we have tunable consistency option as we have in Cassandra? So yes. Uh, I mentioned it at the start, but uh, Scylla is compatible in the protocol level with Cassandra. So everything that you have in Cassandra, you have in Scylla, uh, including a, a tunable replication factor and tunable consistency, tunable read, tunable write, lightweight transaction, and every other feature you can think of. Scylla do include some extra features that are, are not part of uh, Cassandra. Uh, one example we shown today is a uh, workload prioritizations. Other example is uh, a very efficient CDC and there are more. But uh, going back to your question, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you very much. And if you want to see us again, either John Seal University Live or just wait for the recording. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.